Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our first Chit Chat for 2022. I'm really pleased to introduce you this afternoon to Dr. Stephanie Stoller, who has joined us for our first Chit Chat for 2022. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me, Carla. I, I actually didn't ask you when we were catching up prior, but have you been to New Zealand before? No, I'm actually afraid to fly. Um, I, I fly quite often, but I'm not comfortable doing it. So New Zealand is probably a little bit out yeah. of my comfort zone. <laughs> but I've seen well, it's footage of it and amazingly yeah. beautiful country. It's really nice then to be able to beam you in this way and share some of your um, snippet of your expertise and the great work that you're doing um, in your place or your sort of wider uh, community in the area of structured literacy and the science of reading. So I'm just going to take a moment to share everybody, uh, share with everybody a little bit about you. Dr. Stephanie Stoller is the founder of Stephanie Stoller Consulting and the creator of the reading, the reading Science Academy. Dr. Stoller is a part-time assistant professor in the online reading science program at Mount St. Joseph University and a founding member of a national alliance for supporting reading science in higher education. As a board member for the Innovations and Education Consortium, she collaboratively plans the annual MTSS, and we're going to fill in what that acronym is a little bit throughout this chit chat, um, the annual MTSS Innovations and Education Conference. Dr. Stoller has worked as a school psychologist, an educational consultant, and as vice president for professional learning for Acadians Learning. She has provided professional development, conducted research, and published in the areas of assessment, early intervention, and collaborative problem solving. She is passionate about improving educator knowledge and aligning school systems to prevent reading failure. And I just want to share to the end of the bio that you sent through to me, um, sort of the three things that you're currently working on that you shared with me before coming into the chat. So because I think these will be really uh, relevant for our listeners today. So the three things that um, Dr. Stoller is currently working on, she spends half her time um, at uh, Mount St. Joseph University, where she is, of course, an associate professor working with um, doctoral students. And secondly, um, she is about to or has just embarked on a project in higher education. This really excites me no end, um, where she's looking at creating a um, consistent pipeline of um, evidence-based delivery so that the theory students go out and learn in university is the same practical um, experience that they will be doing on their actual practicums. They're not going out to different schools that don't practice following the science of reading. That's really exciting and I can't wait to see how that rolls out so we can um, observe that and perhaps bring some of those tidbits to our um, higher education implementation here in New Zealand. And thirdly, and um, I'm going to say um, super passionately, um, Dr. Stoller has founded the Reading Science Academy, and you shared with me that, that that really is the piece of work that brings you the most joy in observing those individual teachers who make really, really considered and strategic um, focuses on creating a shift in student outcomes in their classrooms. So one incredibly busy lady, it's wonderful to have you joining us this afternoon. Let's jump in with our first sort of area of focus. If you could begin telling us in your experience, why do you, um, oh sorry, all too often we hear from both parents and we hear from classroom teachers that a child has in fact had to experience um, reading, or I'm going to say literacy challenges, or dare I say even reading failure before intervention is actually implemented. And I was just really interested to know what is your perspective on early intervention taking that wait to fail approach and, and sort of why is, why is that your perspective? Yeah, so um, it's a great question and it's such an unfortunate question. Um, circumstance that we're still struggling with uh, in both of our countries. Um, I, I think, you know, the reasons why students have to experience failure before they get the attention they need are, are complex. There are many reasons I think that's happening. But one of them could be that 
until, I don't know, three decades ago, maybe something like that, we didn't really know that reading failure could be prevented. We didn't really have that knowledge base and we didn't have the, the tools in school to really actualize prevention. We've, we've created separate systems based on the idea that reading is natural and it should just happen for students. If we put them in a, a literacy rich environment, if we expose them to books, if we read to them, that when they're ready, quote unquote, it will just happen for them, they'll bloom. And that's kind of been the, the philosophy or approach. And so it's viewed as abnormal if a student doesn't learn to read because it's supposed to be this natural thing that just happens. Um, so we've, we've really created these separate systems in schools, general education, special education, and we've made it so that students have to fail to get entrance into that special education or even the, the resource support kind of realm of a school. That, that these are just two different worlds and you have to be behind to get access to any kind of, of support. And, it, you know, when you think about it now, it's, it really just, it should never have been that way. It shouldn't be that way now. Um, learning and reading in particular exists on a continuum and we need to be able to have all educators equipped to support students wherever they are on that, that continuum of, um, of learning to read, of, of reading skills. So it, I think that that whole approach of, of waiting until the student fails is um, something that certainly the research has moved beyond. And now in practice, we need to move beyond that, that antiquated um, separate system. Hmm. Mm. I think it's really interesting how you pointed out, really, you didn't use these words, but you really were alluding to the fact that it's really a systemic issue and, and that because we've built these isolated systems through our education progression, that, uh, like you said, children need to fit into a special education category. Um, and so I'm, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm thinking, gosh, we've got to break down those walls, don't we? We've got to break down, that, down those walls yeah. and that separation between the, between the two. We talk, we talk a lot in New Zealand about having and um, operating through an inclusive education system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that's something here we need to think about to a deeper level is to truly be inclusive means to have no, no real um, segregated um, terms even around, you know, what is special education, and yeah, that's really got me thinking about that from a from a system from a systemic. Yeah. Um, even the term inclusive means that that you're being let in, right? Like, mm. like there's something, there's an entity, and we're allowing you to be mm. included in it, as a, as if you were on the outer, right? So that's a really valid point too. That even that term itself, why were you not in there from the get go? And were, and were our students not in there from the get-go because the system and the progression through the system didn't allow for them to be in there and to be being successful through their, right. through their reading acquisition. Mm, really and interesting. It, really, it starts in teacher preparation. We, we train, at least in the U.S., we train teachers completely separately in universities the, the general education preparation and special education related service, SLP and school psychologists and so forth, completely separate from the training of, of general education classroom teachers. The, what they're learning, their experiences are completely separate. And, and classroom teachers are taught that they are not the expert, that mm. if something goes wrong, they should refer to, to the experts. So we set mm. it up that way, I think, in a very problematic manner from, from the get-go in, in training. Um, so we're trying to undo some of those yeah. systemic problems, uh, both mm. in higher ed and in schools. Mm. I really liked the quote when you said all educators need to be equipped to, um, to, to support whoever 
they are teaching. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, and, and I truly believe that that's what uh, the science of reading findings and um, the approach called structured literacy, uh, I truly believe that that is what um, that approach has given teachers, that's what I observe here in New Zealand, is that they have increased confidence, they have increased knowledge, and they're developing practice principles that enable them to, to teach that range of students in their class. Absolutely, yep. So, so let's have a think now then about uh, given the system that we're in, and, and I think the system is much the same really from what you're saying here in New Zealand as to what you know, you're working with, particularly in Ohio, um, how can we identify uh, potential risk of reading failure or potential, you know, if we're thinking about building the system mm -hmm. that, in, that where these children are well catered for, according to an evidence base from the get-go, what do you think classroom teachers, school principals, and even parents, what do we need to be mindful of to, um, to identify whether or not a student might be beginning to be at risk? I'm going to use the term lagging. Mm -hmm. So this is um, what, what got me focusing on reading very early in my career, is this this idea and, and knowledge that reading difficulties can be prevented for the vast majority of students, that there are skills that we can assess and there are things that we can do instructionally and with intervention that can make it so that the vast majority of students become readers at the end of first grade. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the things that we want to be watching out for would include um, very early on indicators in spoken language. So difficulties that very young children have uh, in acquiring spoken language, not speaking much, um, not um, responding when spoken to, having difficulty naming things, um, confusing terminology in spoken language, um, you know, as they get older, being stuck on errors in their spoken language, biscetti instead of spaghetti, the, those kinds of confusions. Um, and then difficulty when it comes to, to, to print, um, as they get into the preschool years, difficulty learning letter names, difficulty learning the letters in their name, um, difficulty writing their name um, would be some early indicators. Um, having difficulty talking about what they did last weekend or sequencing events, um, recalling or retelling events, retelling a story that they've listened to, those kinds of indicators. Um, and, and then into uh, kindergarten, um, the first year of, of formal schooling, um, difficulty with the sound structure of language. So what we would call phonemic awareness. So being able to play around with spoken language. So knowing that the word mommy and meatball both start with the same sound mm, and being able to generate another word that starts with mm, that they know of. Um, being able to, to start to become aware of spoken words, not as indicating an item um, or communicating an idea, but being a thing that can be broken down into these little bits, the, the phonemes. And then, um, on into the second year of school, in the first year and into the second year, being able to connect those sound, um, those phonemes of spoken language to the letters and having difficulty with decoding um, is a really important early indicator to pay attention to. So once children are in schools, letter naming, phonemic awareness, so beginning sound, blending and segmenting sounds and spoken words, and then connecting sounds to letters. Those are the early indicators that not only should we be watching out for and paying attention to, but we should be acting on when we've got good high quality assessments that tell us students are struggling in those areas. It's the school's responsibility then to act on that information because those are very manipulatable skills. Mm -hmm. Those are very alterable mm -hmm. um, skills that when we teach them directly, children learn them. 
And they're not just random, nice to have skills. Those are the essential building blocks. So the letter knowledge, the oral language and vocabulary skills, the phonemic awareness, the letter sound and decoding, those are things that if you don't have those skills, it's going to be very difficult for you to learn to read. And we can actually control to a large extent whether or not you learn those skills. Um, so it's something we can teach. And when we do teach it, children are much more likely to be readers. Mm. So it's it's really, I think, encouraging that it's, it's a relatively short list. Um, of course, it's more complicated than what I'm, <laughs> what I'm laying out, but it's a short list of what to watch for and then what to prioritize in the classroom to make sure that every student acquires. You know, we talk about those as essential building blocks or foundations mm -hmm. of literacy, and, and they really are that important. So mm. those would be the things I think to prioritize. Yeah. And so to add to that then for parents, it would be really great for them to know about those things because also there are some things that they can do at home or um, we call our, our preschool here is often called kindergarten or early okay. childhood. Um, so in our New Zealand kindergarten, those types of early skills that you talked about through phoneme or phonological and phonemic awareness and then also the oral language and the sequencing, they're things that once we consciously know about them as parents and preschool educators, we can be building up that skill base too, can't we, before that transition Absolutely. to school. Mm. Absolutely. But, but we need to know what to look for. And then, then once our children have transitioned into that school setting, we want to build an education system where we all understand teachers, principals, um, ministry and government really all understand and value the importance of our schools having diagnostic tools that yes. support teachers in a very efficient way to be able to identify who does and doesn't have those skills. But I guess also too, Stephanie, for, for teachers to be um, having that level of professional learning where they understand the significance of what might be the outcome if one, the student doesn't have the skill and two, we don't teach it because we don't often know how to teach it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you come across that, you know, in your um, in your consulting work that you do too. Absolutely, that's that's the number one um, driving force behind most of the teachers and and administrators that I have the pleasure of working with. They all want to see their students reach mm -hmm. high levels of you know reading proficiency, and they have always thought that they were doing the right things, but they always had the sense that what they were doing wasn't enough, that, mm. that, that it wasn't actually working for mm. many of their students. And so once they understand there's this whole other body of knowledge that in some cases was sort of kept from them, um, you know, they have a range of, of emotions, but mostly they cannot wait to start doing things differently in mm. their reading instruction. And, and they, m most of them get some fairly immediate results from that. Mm. So like I said, these are skills that are influenceable by what we do in the classroom. So mm. to me, that's just so powerful. It's not outside of Absolutely. our control. Even with students who have, um, you know, a family history of dyslexia, students who have um, neurological differences in the challenges that they bring to the classroom or cultural differences, um, that might make learning to read more challenging for them. Even those students respond to instruction that is is prioritizing these skill areas. Mm. So mm. it gives us a lot to work with. And, it does. Um, teachers mm. are excited when they are opened up to it. And, and I think that if we fall back to that sort of systemic issue that we talked about off the bat, that if all of our teachers and all of our leaders understand the significance of having such diagnostic tools and then having the knowledge to be able to teach from those tools, that then we will have, we, we will be much more likely to have an education system where more children become readers through the everyday teaching and learning that occurs in the classroom. That's right. We, we know, however, that uh, we, so we know all brains learn to read, 
by acquiring the same reading network, but what we know is the rate of progress of the acquisition of that reading network is different, right? So right. therefore, we still need, even in this system, that you and I term structured literacy, we still need the opportunity for more intensive or either repetition or um, for more intensive intervention. So I think this leads us really nicely into you potentially explaining to us what does that acronym MTSS stand for and um, what is it and how does it differ from the RTI or the response to intervention model that so many of us have become so familiar with, um, particularly those who work in intervention settings? So MTSS stands for multi-tiered systems of support and um, RTI stands for response to intervention. Some people say RTII, response to intervention and instruction, a uh, couple of different variations there. For me, I've been talking about and working on and with the components of MTSS for 30 years. And what makes up that, that model um, really hasn't changed over that time. Uh, before we were just calling it problem solving, that, that was what we were doing in schools. And in the US when that model of using direct assessment data providing um, preventative academic supports to students, and then a tiered system of, of academic interventions and supports. When that became integrated into our federal legislation, the term response to intervention is what really took off. And people started talking about many of the components of what I've always thought of as what I now call MTSS um, were part of our RTI, but some of the components were not. So, for me, I guess what, what the differences are, the way RTI played out was more responsive. It was more a response to students having difficulties. Um, and it was more individually student focused. And it was just about academic supports. Whereas MTSS is an integrated system. It's a framework really for dealing with academic, with social, emotional, and behavioral concerns. It's a way of thinking about mm. the interrelated systems within your school and matching student needs to effective systems that will support them in every way. So the, the thread that runs through both of those models really should be that problem solving model, that database decision-making approach. So in MTSS, assessment systems is one of the really critical components. You know, I could probably come up with a half dozen or so essential components that if you're not doing these things, then you're not really doing MTSS. And having a comprehensive assessment system is, is one of those. Um, you've already alluded to this, that, mm -hmm. that everybody in schools needs to know where students are on this path to reading. And they, they need to know that universally. So they need to know it about every student. They need to know about the effectiveness of their universal instruction. And they need to know at a much more fine grained level, specifically for students who are struggling, what components are they missing? What should instruction look like? How should instruction be intensified for, for individuals? So having an assessment system is critical in MTSS because what we're trying to do in that three-tiered model is provide the best possible outcomes for the largest number of students with the least amount mm. of resources. So it's about getting it right the first time in instruction. So what we think of as tier one, the first reading instruction that everybody gets, that needs to be so well matched to the needs of the students that it causes most of the students to meet the grade level expectations. Mm -hmm. So no intervention, nobody, you know, um, pulling them out of the classroom for something extra, just what they get in the regular reading classroom instruction needs to be fitting their needs, needs to be lined up to their needs so that instruction is not over their heads. It's not boring them with something they already know as much as possible. It's right where where their next step is for instruction. 
And the way that we know that is universal screening. If we're screening all students on these essential uh, components that I've mentioned, then we can design our classroom reading instruction to meet the needs of our students. Yes, there's a general plan that, you know, we're going to roll out every year, but we have to customize that general plan when we screen students three times a year. That's how we should be using that universal screening data. Um, and I don't see that happening as much. I see screening data being used to find individuals who are at risk, but not to assess the health and wellness mm. of that classroom reading instruction. So that's a, a real missing component. And then we need to use diagnostic assessment, progress monitoring assessment to put in place those, those additional supports, that extra dose, what we call tier two in an MTSS model, that extra dose of small group instruction, in addition to what happened in tier one, for students who are at risk, who have additional challenges, and monitor their progress to make sure that it is causing them to, to catch up. Um, not that we're coming back and accommodating them at some lower level skill, but that tier two is actually accelerating their learning and, and catching them up. And if we're getting it right for the vast majority of students in tiers one and two, that leaves us with a very small proportion of students who get the most mm. intensive resources. So whether those are students with disabilities or students with more short-term intensive needs, tier three is sort of like the best version of instruction that we can give to students. Um, but we can only do that with a very small number of students effectively. So it really rests on that base of, of getting, getting it right with the first way we teach reading through a preventative uh, tier one approach. So I'm rambling on. I don't, I don't no, know. If I've no, it's great. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of um, summarize a few of the key points that you made through there. And I'm going to go from, from the back end if that's okay. <laughs> so um, first and foremost, what you're saying is that uh, so I'm going to go from tier one to tier two to tier three. Tier one. So if we are a classroom teacher or a school leader or somebody else in education who's influencing and enabling evidence-based education, what is efficient, effective and incredibly important is to ensure that we have quality tier one instruction happening in our classrooms because we have an obligation. I love how you keep coming back to this word cause. Um, we have an obligation to cause success in reading yes. acquisition. And um, I wrote down, you know, this question as you were talking, does what we do cause the most students to succeed in our classrooms? And maybe that's a takeaway for people who are who are listening to us today to, to consider, you know, does what we do cause the, the greatest number of students to be successful? Uh, if it doesn't, the problem is people have to know what to look for in that um, in those components or those elements. So they, so they need to have that list. And we, we will actually create that list from what you've said earlier um, as part of this chit chat for people to pick up on. But we have to have the classroom instruction right. We then know that as part of that classroom instruction, we have to have a range of diagnostic assessments and some progress monitoring tools where we can identify students who might not be uh, making as rapid progress as what we have anticipated. And we elevate them to tier two because we need to implement teaching that causes them to catch up. Yes. So it's therefore a little bit more intensive. And then again, through that progress monitoring and those diagnostic assessments um, and that universal screening that you talked about that you think should actually happen three times a year um, will help us to then also determine through that, you know, who are those students that are that are in that tier three and, and needing um, the most intensive uh, intervention and or teaching and those students need the best version of instruction so therefore would you say those students at tier three must have the most qualified knowledgeable and experienced practitioners providing that intervention absolutely 
absolutely. Students who need the most intensive support should have the most highly qualified instructor. Yeah, when those decisions are being made. Because as we move up those tiers from sort of classroom instruction to a little bit more intensive repetition to intensive intervention, the complexity of that student in terms of their academic, their social, their emotional and their behavioural, the complexity of that profile would be so much greater than a student that is succeeding in tier one. That's right. The, the complexity of the student and the, um, the, the need for that instructor to be responsive to the, to, to individualize what that student needs. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's where sort of the art of, of that highly qualified instructor comes into play. So because, you, because you're dealing every moment with, with responding to planning and, and being proactive, but then in the moment responding to what mm. the student is doing mm. in such a skillful way, because mm. you don't have a minute to waste, literally. <laughs> um, you just don't. And yes. so those teachers really need to be so skillful and artful to be able to get that match so tight mm. so that every moment is maximized. Um, it, it makes it sound very, um, in, well, intense, right? Like it is, yeah. That but, it, but let's face it, it is stakes. intense. It is high stakes and it is intense. And as you sort of talked to that little piece, Dr. Anita Archer springs to mind and all of the work that she contributes in that space of explicit instruction. Because, you know, those, those interventionists who are working at tier three become really good with that perky pace and they, yes. they come equipped with the knowledge and skills and really honed explicit instruction to be able to, to flex, but to flex without going down rabbit holes that aren't relevant for that individual they sit across from. That's right. It, it really is, um, it's a really critical set of skills and it, it takes a lot of learning, a mm. lot of coaching. Um, it takes a lot of development to become a professional who has that mm. skill set, I think, who can really be effective mm. with mm. students like that coupled with an open mind and being willing to be coached and to be willing to be open to reflecting on your practice too. Yes. Um, yes. Doesn't it, you know, because we, we have to grow and um, yeah, but gosh, you know, I'm really excited to share with you that across New Zealand, there's an increasing body of what we call structured literacy specialist teachers. Nice. Um, actually working in tier three in schools and they really are becoming incredibly skilled and um, and they are causing much greater reading success which is very very exciting so if we think about then the characteristics that school leaders should really work hard to ensure are present in the intervention system we've we've heard the difference between um, the multi-tiered um, support system and the response to intervention. Um, and, and you've talked about some of those components, the assessment system, the diagnostic assessment, the progress monitoring, um, and then obviously having knowledgeable, skilled teachers to, to operate in those tier two and tier three. Um, is there anything else in terms of characteristics that school leaders might need to give consideration to in um, implementing a gold standard intervention system? So I think the other components that I probably haven't touched on um, that should be part of an MTSS uh, include teaming. So having structures for teaming at the, at the district level, the building level, the grade level, and for individual students. And if we're doing it right, we don't need to have individual student teams until we're at tier three. So that grade mm -hmm. level team, that building level planning team, those are essential components. And what they're doing is that database decision making or problem solving mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. I think leadership is a component. So whether that's the building leader or someone else, it could be a coach, it could be an SLP, it could be a classroom teacher, somebody has to be out front in front of everybody else, sort of taking the lead and the person who says, this, this is where we're going, this is how we're going to get there, and we're not veering off course. Like somebody has to be, you know, towing that line. Mm. Um, 
I, I think parent and community engagement is a, another essential component. This is not something that a school building can accomplish on its own or should accomplish without the engagement of their families and other community members. And so they are part of that teaming mm -hmm. structure, I would say. Um, as far as implementing interventions, what, what school leaders would want to consider um, would be, and you've touched on many of these things, the professional learning for the people who are implementing the interventions, the careful selection of the intervention approaches or programs, um, that cannot be overstated how important it is to carefully select. Mm -hmm. um, that those are aligned to the research, that there's evidence that what is being selected actually has worked for students like yours, and that you have a way of matching student needs with diagnostic assessment and universal screening to the, the right instructional package. So to the instructional routine or approach mm -hmm. or program. It's not just, you know, a menu of I need one of these and that and, you know, and, and having a list mm -hmm. that you release in your school. You have to have a process, that problem solving process of matching students to, um, to those resources. And then one component that, that buildings don't often think about is the idea of flexible service delivery. This is really important for implementing uh, reading interventions that it, again, it goes back to some of the silos and separateness that we've created in education. Uh, whether it's a funding stream or what somebody's title is, we get really locked into, I can only work with these students or mm. this is my, my title, so I'm only going to work you know, with this type of student. And that might not be, probably isn't the best way to serve your students. So it's much more appropriate again, to use the universal screening data to identify the needs of the whole building or each grade level, and then take a look at what are our human resources? Who are the adults that are available in our school? Mm. And then be very thoughtful about how are we going to use our human capital to meet the needs of these students and, and to really work beyond those artificial barriers that are caused by position titles or funding streams um, even like I've referred to the, the special ed and general ed, mm. but to just think about what does the student need and what's our most efficient and effective way to provide it. So, so being flexible with service delivery, I think is um, an important mm. component. Mm. Thank you so much, my goodness. And that short, um, not quite 40 minutes, you have shared an awful lot of um, information and insight. And I really hope that for the parents and the classroom teachers and the school leaders and other people who work within and across the education system, I think they will have taken an awful lot away from, from this chit chat. I'm just gonna quickly go back. I've written some numbered notes on the key things that have been my takeaways to share with you. Number one is that it's really, really important important that we do build an education system where all educators are equipped to support whoever they are teaching. So therefore, ensuring that we have higher education that is able to um, offer uh, uh, evidence-based professional learning in the area of the science of reading in both theory and then to go out into practicums is going to be really, really important if we are going to sustain and continue to influence a shift into evidence-based um, education going forward. Yeah. Um, you also shared with us, uh, which will be particularly relevant for some parents that are watching and also for classroom teachers, the things to watch out for. And you gave us those key points, beginning with spoken language and then moving through, ending up to where our students are sort of in their first or second year and determining whether or not they're able to, what we would say, match the sound to the symbol or match the sound to the letters and vice versa. So those yeah. really basic foundation literacy skills, ensuring that we are really switched on as parents and that we are really switched on as classroom teachers and school leaders to ensure we're monitoring those things. We then moved into talking about the components of multi-tiered systems and um, we dipped into that tier one, tier two and tier three. 
And what I just really want to pick up there is the importance of the person at tier three being the most um, qualified, I, I want to say qualified human capital. We need to, in New Zealand, I feel like we need to build more qualified human capital in tier three uh, to ensure that our students have the very, very best support um, in our school settings. And you shared with us the various components that make up that multi-tiered system, um, starting from the assessment system all the way through to that flexible service delivery. And, um, and, and you pointed out the importance of stakeholder engagement and ensuring that we have everybody on board. And that's what I love about that multi-tiered support system, not only, um, you know, do we focus on one isolated area of academics, but we really are thinking about that student from a very holistic perspective when we incorporate their social, emotional and behavioural um, elements as well. So Absolutely. thank you so much, Dr. Stoller, for joining us for this chit chat today. I hope it's you've enjoyed pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed beaming into New Zealand just for a short, short um, period of time. Absolutely. And and I wish you all the very best for your um, for your three projects, but in particular for your higher education project uh, that you're working on to try and streamline and ensure there's consistency between the theory and the practical for teachers during their teacher training. So I'm just going to hand over to you to have one last sort of parting comment. If there's one really important message that you'd like to leave um, our viewers with um, this afternoon in our time, um, what would that be? Uh, I think I'd like to just leave everyone with the um, message that that it is possible to prevent reading failure. It is possible to intervene effectively when students are already struggling. And if you're unsure, if you have a sort of a feeling that your own child might be struggling or that there could be something more for a student who you are educating, that you reach out to someone, reach out to an entity, um, reach out to another educator, to a friend, uh, seek some support, don't wait. If you are having a, a feeling that something might not be going as well as it should, um, act on that feeling mm. and, um, and get some support. So uh, there's a lot that can be done when we catch these kinds of issues early, but there's also a lot of really effective intensive support that can be provided even when students are are struggling readers or have disabilities so don't mm -hmm. don't delay don't uh, hesitate reach out and get support very very wise words thank you so so much for your time this afternoon and thank you to everybody who's joined us for today's um, chit chat our next chit chat is on tuesday the 29th of march where we're fortunate enough to be joined by dr tanya siri from latrobe university so we look forward to seeing many of you back here then